Welcome everybody. My name is Maurice McDermott. I'm president and CEO here and I'll be the moderator, um, which just means that I'll introduce our two esteemed speakers today. The title of the presentation is San Antonio Stone and Water, How the Alamo Was Designed and Decorated and how people got their water. Now, these are two, it seems like these might be disparate um, topics, but they are in fact highly integrated. And I have to take a few, one or two minutes to say on the witty actually, they literally are integrated. And I urge you when you take a break to walk out along the river and at the north part of the property, you will see the symbolic, the interpretive um, diversion dam that was built here in 1719 and um, funneled water into the 1719 Asequia Madre, built by uh, Mission Indians and Spanish. And then it went down, it, right in front of the opening entrance of the Witte Museum, the Asequia Madre actually began. It was, we believe, um, 16 to 20 feet wide. We didn't make it that wide, we made it 12 feet. But we, again, a symbolic uh, Asequia Madre channel that went down through the farmlands and fed the farmlands along the way and then went to um, what was eventually called Mission de Valero. It wasn't there until 1724 and then the Alamo. Many people historically, particularly in the 20th century, called this the Alamo Dam. Mrs. Quillen, who founded the Witte Museum, called it the Mother Ditch for Aseki Madre. So, I mean, and then she decided it was dangerous and filled it in. We have un we've uncovered it. So it's been really a thrilling archaeological um, journey. And I just want to make sure that you knew that there is actually a connection between the Alamo and the Asequias that um, our speakers are going to speak to. I'm going to introduce both of our um, speakers, and then they are going to uh, talk. Um, so first of all, we have Pamela uh, Jerry Rosser, um, who is the conservator of the Alamo, doing really astonishing work. Um, I've seen a couple of her presentations. I bet she's going to uh, share the latest and greatest today. Really important work, groundbreaking work. Um, she's a native San Antonio and a ninth generation Texan. Pam has been a practicing conservator for over 25 years. Prior to working at the Alamo, Pam partnered with her mom, Sissy Jerry, and together they owned and operated Restoration Associates for 15 years and traveled through the southern United States um, doing preservation. She graduated from the University of Incarnate Word and is a professional associate of the American Institute for Conservation of Historic and Artistic Works, a member of the Association for Preservation Technology Internationally, and some of her past projects include the San Antonio, uh, excuse me, this, sorry, the San Fernando Cathedral, Mission Concepcion, and Steve's uh, Homestead, um, the San Antonio City Chambers, and Empire Theater. I mean, these are obviously the iconic structures of San Antonio, and so Pam's done very critical and important work. Um, Clinton McKenzie. Clint McKenzie is a PhD student at the University of Texas at San Antonio with his focus on the Spanish colonial archaeology of South Texas. He is employed as a historical archaeologist at the UTSA Center for Archaeological Research, commissioner of the Bayer County Historical um, Commission, the Bayer County Archaeological Steward for the Texas Historical Commission, and chair of the S Southern Texas Archaeological Association. He holds a BA from UTSA and MS from Trinity University. He's been involved in the archaeology of South Texas for 40 years in excavations and surveys. 40 years? That I, you're so young. I mean, you look so young for that. And his interest in Spanish Spanish irrigation system stems from excavation experiences with the majority of colonial acequias in the upper San Antonio River Valley. And actually, Clint's name is on the study for the acequias, the acequia, the, what, what he calls the Alamo Dam, and also the upper labor here in Brackenridge Park. So we feel very close to Clint's work, obviously. We also have Kay Hines, the city archaeologist. City and Kay ha knows every square inch of this property and Brackenridge and the amazing uh, archaeological archaeological uh, discoveries over really, the, what do you think, Kay, the last uh, five to ten years, which are really, you know, reshaping the narrative, the archaeological narratives, and uh, we're, we at the Witty are very excited to be on that journey with you all. So with that, Pam, go ahead. Hello. Okay. 
We are going to start um, in the sacristy. You can see on the left, there is a little arrow that's leading you. So if you'll walk with me in there. Um, as a conservator, I'm just going to give you a little three-minute blurb of what I do before we get into um, some other um, fun findings. Um, as a conservator, I'm there at the Alamo to preserve the walls, and what I am doing is removing efflorescence, which are salts that have built up on the walls, um, doing conservation cleaning and stabilization. So um, when I do the cleaning and um, I find evidence of fresco fragments, which really started this um, really changing how the history of the um, the story of the Alamo is told because for years everybody said um, since it never had a roof it was never decoratively painted well when we started doing our work in the year 2000 um, we changed that so um, this sort of shows you when we're doing um, the edge stabilization the dark area that you see that is Spanish colonial plaster in the white it looks like some snakes um, that is the edge stabilization, and then I go back and I apply aquasporca, which is a fancy term for um, dirty water with a conservation um, <laughs> product applied to it, so then it doesn't ever um, wash away. It just um, helps bind the um, edge stabilization to the other surfaces. Oh wait, I went too fast, sorry. Okay, and this is injection. So injections are really fun because it's a hydraulic mortar that has the consistency of baby powder, and um, you just send it with distilled water, and then you're filling the void behind the plaster, and you want to do that because you don't, if there's nothing, you know, behind the plaster, then eventually the historic plaster is going to fall off. So by doing these injections, I'm stabilizing the plaster that's there. And when... Um, after we stabilize the plaster, we then start to do the cleaning. So if you look on the where it says before, that was um, eight to nine layers of U.S. Army whitewash. Because if you remember, the U.S. Army came in um, in 1847, and they did not want the Alamo to look like a church. And so they painted everything white. And then... Um, Years later, then the daughters came in, and, and they didn't know it had the decorative painting either. And so um, when they decided in, in two, no, let's see, 1999, they were going to open up the sacristy, and one of them saw this little triangle on the wall, and it was yellow, and they said, oh, my gosh, that looks like there's something on the wall. And so they overnight raised the money. And um, we put in a dance floor in the sacristy, and we started shaving through um, eight to nine layers of U.S. Army whitewash, and we discovered uh, three different patterns, and this is one of them. We're going to start at the top of the wall and work our way down. So um, you can see the, on the left, it looks like there's nothing there. But with magnification and exacto knives and distilled water and sea sponges, we found this beautiful um, floral and pomegranate pattern. So, and um, in doing so, as you're shaving off all these layers, well, more um, pieces to the puzzle are developed. You see, you've got these incised lines at the top, and those are visible all throughout the sacristy. And what that tells, um, me is that they laid out these stencil patterns they um <clears throat> and they gridded they had a grid and then they also had to have and i keep saying stencil because if you trace the design and then you flip it over and lay it on top of the next repeat everything lines up perfectly so it wasn't done by freehand if it was freehand there'd be a little you know, um, the flower would be bigger, there would be some alterations, but everything is perfect. And if you look at it under really high resolution, you can even see um, the little itty bitty dots. So everybody wants to know, what are these dots? Okay, so there was not a Walmart or any store, art store, where they could go and buy the mylar or, you know, so they had to make their own, um, paper and so what they use they didn't use paper they used animal skin and what animal is really um has thin skin would be a goat a rabbit a pig and they would stretch it out and once it was dry then they then drew their cartoon and then they took a piece of flint and they made little holes 
And then um, while the plaster was still wet, the, the method here is a traditional fresco method. So the plaster is damp, not wet, it's damp. They would apply the stencil pattern to the wall and then they would take a, um, a, a pounce bag of powdered pigment and they would pounce it over the stencil and remove it. And then when they removed it, they would then go back and they would connect all the dots. And then they just repeated it on and on and on. And then they would go back and paint the various colors that you see inside. So it was a, this is a traditional method that has been passed down and taught for centuries, decades and decades and decades. So as you can see here, um, this is a sacristy. This is after we've done all of our work in 2000 and then I was back in there in I think 2010. Um, but what was, ha what was happening was I was studying these patterns and I noticed that there were design elements that were missing and I couldn't figure out how to determine what was missing and I needed help with that. And so I um, decided that doing some research that there is some other really cool high tech um, technology that can help me. And so I um, began working with um, Trinity University and they're the ones that have um, the image on the left. It's called a portable XRF and what it is is it's a um, it looks like a Star Wars gun and it actually can analyze the pigment on the wall without me having to harvest a sample and then do the analysis um, in my lab and then the image on the right is this awesome camera it's called a multi-spectral camera multi-spectral imaging and um, Dennis is um, a colleague of mine and and he um, puts different filters and takes an image that's about maybe eight to 10 inches away from the wall. And with different filters, he is then able to pull out um, some of the design elements that I cannot see under a UV light or natural light. So we're gonna just briefly go through both of these two steps and how we all sort of combine together and become the perfect conservator. Um, so here's Dennis, and you can see his little camera, and it's very high-tech. Um, he, he'll spend, he goes along the wall and just takes these photos, and then goes down and then goes back. And so he'll spend maybe five days on, uh, let's say, a 10-foot section, and then he goes back into his lab, and then he pieces all the images together. Um, and so in doing so, okay, look at this. I just get so excited. Okay, so... Um, the photo on the, up the upper right has those little dots, um, and those are my dots because when you look at that freeze band today, you can barely see the scroll that comes underneath that curve and then goes and connects the, the other design element that's on the left with the red looking fat U at the bottom. Okay, so those actually connect. So with Dennis's uh, multi-spectral camera, we are able to complete this freeze band and know how it was painted. However, um, I'll walk over here. Okay, if you look at this here, I still think that this is not finished. Something's missing here because it doesn't make sense to me. Okay. <laughs> I'm still researching that. Okay, and then, okay, okay. Um, so this is the um, center oval. It's on the, e the west and the south wall, and it doesn't exist on the east wall because there's a big window there. And when you look at it, like under natural light, it just looks like a really plain band. But you can see from the multispectral camera that there is a lot of detail in just the frame itself. And we don't know what's inside the frame because a lot of it is lost. Um, but I still think we'll be able to find fragments of it. But then can you see, okay, so that's his multispectral image. That's probably eight or ten images that he stitched together. And so you can really see all the detail that went into the frame of, um, of this oval shape which is it's just beautiful and okay this is you can't see this at all and I'm so sad um, but it's totally faded into the plaster and we were playing around with the UV light and um, raking the wall and all of a sudden we saw this branch 
And so you can see kind of on the right or the left, it, it's a floral motif that comes up like a stalk and then it fans out. And, um, and when we saw that, we were shocked because you turn off the UV light and you don't see anything. So it's, the design is totally faded into the plaster, but it was found on three walls because the north wall is gone. The army rebuilt it, and so that part is gone. But, so this exists, and it's centered um, perfectly between the two ovals. Um, and this is also with, the, with, with his camera, and you can see on the image on the right, there's a base. So you have a base, um, then that is directly above the freeze band. And then one thing that we don't know, and this is bothering me, is, um, is the urn. What is the shape of the urn and what, how was the urn painted? And then you have the floral motif that then sits on top of it. So the image on the left is the freeze band. And then the drawing on the right is then sits um, above the freeze band. And so the sacristy was very ornately painted by very skilled artists. And this is the wainscot, um, which is only about three feet at left in length. Um, all, everywhere else, it's completely gone. But what um, his camera helped us determine was it was not just painted with yellow ochre. It was outlined in a, um, either a white, um, we're not really sure yet, but there's also red. And the red is either a red ochre or um, vermilion, which is exciting because vermilion is not common here in Texas or, um, or the, anywhere in the United States, they had to have brought it with them and it comes from Europe. So when they came here, they had a plan and they, they brought vermilion um, with them. Okay, so you got to see all these images, but then the question is, okay, with these designs, we know some of them are yellow ochre, um, charcoal, and red ochre. But there's still some other designs that we don't, we don't know how they were painted. We see the designs and there's nothing there. So with the portable XRF, then she's able to um, come in and do an analysis on site and help me discover other pigments. And so this is that floral and pomegranate that's at the top of the wall in the sacristy. And you can see there, the, uh, inside that pomegranate, it looks like there's nothing. But when she put her gun there, um, I'm sorry, portable XRF, um, <laughs> it identified copper, copper green pigment. Okay, so copper, you have to make copper. So um, does anybody know? Well, we'll ask that question. Ask me that later, how you make copper. Um, so that is copper inside. And then the floral on the left, where you see those sort of cactus leaves coming up, that's earth green. Well, earth green is a mineral that's very common in our region. So there's two types of greens that they used, which is it was very sophisticated. This is um, the yellow ochre that outlines the... Um, the pomegranate, and then, let's see, did I do, and there's, um, that MG is the earth green, and, um, oh, let me go back real quick, um, and then the red that you see on the top of the pomegranates, that's vermilion, and, um, and then there's also red that outlines the part of the petal of the flower, and then the inside of the petal of the flower is yellow ochre. So when Trinity has, um, they're doing the analysis. This shows you what they get a reading of immediately. So um, you've got the pomegranate, and then um, what you see there with the really high, like mountainy um, reading is the, the copper. So you can see the copper just sh that was in the center of the pomegranate just sh shot off the page, which we were so excited. And um, this is um, that floral motif. I'm going to show you all in just a minute, but the floral motif that you can't see from doing her readings, because what we do is we grid the, the wall, and a lot of it, for this design in particular, we had to do it um, in the dark with um, glow-in-the-dark fishing line and, um, and grid this little area, and then she would then in one inch squares um, do an analysis. And so what we found at the end of each of the stems of the floral motif was high levels of um, lead. And so I know it's not white 
lead because the walls, the base color for the wall is just off white. So it has to be like a red, le red lead, or maybe it was white and red, which would make pink. Um, but so we're trying to figure out till this day, what is the shape of the flowers? And so our speculation is it looks kind of like a three petal flower, but that can all change. And so this kind of gives you an idea from her readings, okay, you can see the what color. The copper is a green, which you can see is in the center, and then it sort of fans out. And then you've got the lead, um, which is sort of, you know, we're just making up what we think these flowers might look like, which is pretty exciting. But I need an actual, you know, visual of these flowers in order to draw a conclusion. And see there, right there, it's mercury. It's vermilion. It's so it could be a lily. I don't, I don't know. We that's a speculation. Um, and this shows you how we worked it in the dark. So this is what it looked like. You know, we've got these two UV lights, and then um, I don't think I have a picture of the fishing line, but that sort of gives you an idea of of what this floral motif look you looked like during the Spanish era. Okay, and then ah, okay. Um, below the freeze another time we're playing around with the uv light and we all of a sudden saw these tiny little streaks um, below the freeze and then when i got my portable microscope and um, i put it on the wall and started looking around i found um, copper and trinity did the analysis and once again it was copper i've had other conservators like oh no it's not copper it's um, just a metal leaf and i I said, no, we did the analysis and the, the copper level was, that was 100%. So it, it's copper leaf. So we found this not only in the, um, in the sacristy, um, and it would have been a band that was about two and a half or more inches wide um, that would have gone around the perimeter of the room, but we also found it uh, in the confessional as you would walk in that doorway right um, above. So the Alamo was decoratively painted and ha had this beautiful gilding. Um, and this shows you like in 2000, this is just a simple little CAD drawing of what we found. And, and then in 16, how, um, what additional work we did using state-of-the-art technology and what was discovered. Okay, so we're going to leave the sacristy now, and we're going to go on to another room, real uh, area real quick where I have found other areas. So if you're walking the church and you are going to, you just come in the entrance door, you're going to turn around and you're going to look above the main um, window and the entrance, and there are two pinstriped lines that go um, along the length of, um, of that wall. And um, I found them in three or four different places. And that was all that, um, that I found. I didn't find um, any yellow ochre or um, any other color. Doesn't mean it's not there, but I just haven't discovered it yet. Um, then we're gonna go, if you, so the, that opening is the entrance at the bottom. And so if you walk through the nave and then you kind of veer off to the right, um, that is the transept area right there. And, um, just right up on that wall nearest the chancel, there is a wall and there is this um, yellow ochre vertical um, band that goes up the wall. And I, it's, you know, it's about four, three, three feet tall and then it stops and then it goes um, a little bit more and it, so it continually goes up, but I didn't find it again um, on that same wall, maybe creating a frame doesn't mean it's not there it just I haven't found it yet so there's um, still a lot of discovery happening at the Alamo and um, all of this will all be told in, in a story soon and it's very exciting and I really appreciate y'all's time thank you <laughs> Well, you'll have some time to ask Pam questions, um, but right now we'll go ahead and have Clint McKenzie. See if I can get this thing to work right. Well, not the right. That's not a good sign. I started out with the wrong one. Can I go back one? There we go. Okay. Well, uh, it's still morning, right? Good morning. <laughs> 
I, I hope that I can be as excited as, uh, as Pam was. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, you know, uh, I think it comes out of Hebrews where it says that faith is the, uh, the substance of things longed for but uh, yet unseen, and that's very true in archaeology. There's things that we've, we have faith about and we don't get to see them because they're usually buried. And so a large part of this uh, presentation is to talk about uh, some things ending in fruition, at least here in Brackenridge Park and on the grounds of the Witty. Um, UTSA CAR, who I work for, has done quite a lot of work in San Antonio, but also quite a lot of work here in Brackenridge Park. And there are two Asakia systems here, and uh, we've done work on them, both of them, in the last uh, five years, and I wanted to kind of present to you uh, our results. So I want to talk to you first about Asakias. Uh, I don't want to presume that you know uh, as much as I do about Spanish colonial irrigation canals, uh, which are very exciting. But the, uh, there were at least 11 Asakia systems in San Antonio. Uh, two of them were private. The other ones were a combination of parochial and secular systems. Uh, this just happens to be a list of them uh, here on this, uh, here on this uh, slide. And I want to talk to you briefly about how they worked. So the two that I'm talking about today are the Upper Labor, which is on the west bank of the San Antonio River, and I want to talk about the Valero system, or the Alamo Ditch system, which is on the east bank of the river. The star, of course, is here at the Woody Museum, and literally here on the grounds at the, at the river is where the, uh, the, the system that served uh, Mission San Antonio de Valero started. So how do acequias work and why do they work? There would be no uh, San Antonio without water. It's not a case of just having access to a river. Uh, how do you get the water out of the river? Uh, in places where rivers are deeply cut, you have to find a way to lift that water out of the river to bring it and have it flow down onto cropland. And the benefit of San Antonio and one of the things that brought the Spanish here was the fact that they identified in their entradas when they came here that there were places where you could actually take water out of the San Pedro Creek and out of the San Antonio River with ease. And that that, because it flowed downhill, you know, water does flow downhill, uh, that's how the systems work. Now, the other thing that's interesting about Asaki is that a lot of people don't really think about is they are open systems. They start on a body of water and they end on a body of water. They don't just go and flood a field. They literally are an open system. And uh, we'll take a look at some of how that works. Here's a small one. Uh, this is a, one of the private systems, which was called the Arrocha Asequia, which is, uh, we've looked for it, we haven't found it, it's probably gone, but it started just below San Pedro Springs Park. You can see where Myrtle Street is, and then they had a little wooden dam, a little presita, and it, wa the water flowed into the property down and then back into San Pedro Creek. So you've got an open loop system, because the, the system isn't always watering the fields. So it has to always be available to water the fields. And what you do is you open up a gate that allows water to flow into the field. When you've flooded, you, you've flooded your field, done your irrigation, you close the gate and the water keeps going back down into, the, into whatever body of water. Most of the time it goes back to the body of water it started on. There are some acequias that start on the river and go back into a creek. And here's some examples uh, using the Espada Dam and the Espada Ditch. Uh, down on the south side, and you can see, I'm going to pull a pan and come up here. Um, this is the same site, but you're looking at it from two slightly different perspectives. First, this is the river here, the same river here, obviously. And what is, what is happening is there is a dam, what that dam that you see here, blocks the river and raises the level of the river up. It raises the level of the river up so that it can push the water into the mouth of the Asakia. And here's the mouth of the Asakia right here, the Asakia Channel, which is up here. You can't see it because it's back behind this image. But that's what the purpose of these dams were, was to impound water briefly. Because the water obviously flows over the dam, but they impounded it enough so that the water would rise to the level to go into the channel of the Asakia system itself. And so that's how these things work. They work with gravity. And the Spanish were rather clever. I mean, this, the system itself, acequia is an Arabic word, which uh, you know, means the waterway or the irrigation canal. And this was a, this is what the, the Iberian Peninsula is not known for having a reliable water supplies. And the, and the Moors, when they were there, 
uh, they built all of these systems to irrigate. And the Spanish just continued the same process, both in the old world as well as in the new. So we know uh, from the founding documents, if you were here for Kay's presentation, uh, that, you know, in, that in 1718, the, the, the Presidio was founded, uh, a Villa was founded, the Villa de Bejar was founded, but only in name only, uh, as well as uh, San Antonio de Valero, which was uh, at that time on the West Bank, uh, far across the West Bank of the San Antonio River and on the, uh, on the San Pedro Creek at the time. Uh, and this is kind of referential to what Kay had talked about, uh, about whether or not there were pre-existing acequias. Uh, I don't know whether this is a counterpoint or not, because I don't know the answer to that question. But if you look here, uh, Alarcon, so in January, so seven months after they've started here in San Antonio, he gives orders to have acequias built. So he's either building more or he's building new. Uh, and we... But we don't know for sure exactly where these acequias were. It's an assumption that it, the first was this 1719 Valero system is here in, in, in Brackenridge Park. It's possible it might represent one over in San Pedro Creek. The, you know, our, our investigations haven't been able to tell us with certainty, but we know that certainly by 1724, all of Valero's activities had moved to the, to the east bank of the San Antonio River. Uh, the, in fact, at that, that, that point, the mission did move. That was the third time it moved when it got to Alamo Plaza. So let me talk about uh, Valero's system. So when we think of the Alamo, a lot of us think it's just this very, you know, geographically prescribed place on Alamo Plaza. But the reality is it was a much bigger system. I mean, sure, you had the mission, the compound itself, the Pueblo of the mission, but you also had all of the farmland So this is, that's what we're looking at here. Um, and by the time the system was at its height, there were over 12 miles of excavated canals serving the Valero system. Uh, quite a robust system. So what was its purpose? Well, during the, during the Spanish period, during the period of its missions, it was designed to be a system to provide water principally for irrigation, uh, but also uh, for consumption. Um, after secularization, you didn't have as many people to maintain the system, and it kind of fell into disuse. And then with the advent of the Texas Revolution and more people moving to San Antonio, uh, the, the system was rehabilitated. We'll talk a little bit more about that because the city took over the management of, these, uh, took over the management of what became known as the Alamo Ditch. And those things lasted all the way until the end of the 19th and to the beginning of the 20th century. And again, we'll kind of come back to that. So the blue square there is the property uh, that comprises, the, in large measure, the Woody Museum and the grounds running all the way up to, to uh, Hildebrand Avenue. And you can see we're here on the uh, east bank of the river. And then you can see in this lower one, the, the, that's the Witty property. Uh, the, the one on the far left is the Witty property with the river in between. And there's this anvil-shaped piece of property. Uh, and so here, here is the Witty. Here's the San Antonio River here, making this odd anvil-shaped piece of property here. The map is a historic map. That map is a, a, a group of size map. He was a city engineer. And this map was done sometime between 1865 and probably 1867. It's not dated, uh, but it is the map of the Confederate Tannery, uh, which was across the river at this location. And we'll come back to that because the tannery is associated with the upper Laborde as well. The thing that's important to note about this particular map is it says here, Old Dam. It shows a dam projecting from the west bank all the way down to the east bank. And it shows two Asakia mounds jumping off here. And here's the same map with all of them, uh, but it looks slightly expanded. You can see uh, up here is the upper labor. Here's an Asakia, here's an Asakia. They're real close to each other. Yeah. The upper labor just dates later in time. It started in 1776. And 
and I'll talk about that shortly. Uh, but that's, that's a, a map of the, the, the Confederate improvements to create the cannery and sawmills that they had there during the Civil War. So here's a series of other maps that are really important to understanding the, 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 the Alamo Dam. And you know, I'm going to call it, the, more often I'll call it the Alamo Dam and Ditch or the Madre Dam in Madre Ditch, but it's the system for Valero. And you know, it, it changes over time, even in the in the archival record, it's named it's named five different ways. And so you kind of have to work it, you know, looking over time when it's actually called. Uh, this uh, the far left map is uh, is the map of San Antonio uh, in 1852, the town track map. And the thing, there's a couple things I want you to know. Number one, I want you to know block 23. Is it's right here at the corner of Lot 23 where the dam is shown on this map and the acequia is shown coming off. So, but I also want you to know, look how, look at these little dots. That dotted line represents the, the dam, the, 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 the Presa de la Vera or the Alamo Dam, and look at the huge pool of water behind it. <laughs> so that large pool of water has to push that water through the acequia system. And if you had 12 miles of operating ditches, you need a bit of a push. And so that, that's one of the reasons that that pool looks so large. Then we have the same map that I showed you from 65, maybe 65 or 7. This is just blown up showing the old dam, two miles of the Asakia. And here's another one by the same engineer in 1875, about a decade later, that shows a dam. It doesn't show it being curvilinear. And now there's only one Asakia not shown. Not my fault. <laughs> and this is a this is uh, Louis Giraud. He's a he was city engineer for about twenty years. His dad was an engineer in the eighteen forties and a city mayor. This red line represents uh, Hilton Grand Avenue, and this represents Broadway. So you can kind of triangulate yourself. Here's our friend the Anvil, and then you have uh, you, it, it, it's it, this map is frustratingly tantalizingly imagined because you can't see the details as much as you'd like. And I'm not talking about the projection of the map. If you actually see the map, it'll drive you nuts. But a couple of things to note is that there is an Asaki one shown here. This is probably about 1879. Uh, yeah, it's 1879, uh, not two. Uh, but we have, it, it's hard to see whether the dam is even still here. Okay. And look at all of this. That's all of the channels for the Almost Creek and all of the springs that serve the headwaters of the San Antonio River. We don't see that at all today. The only thing we see is the area of the Blue Hole on the Incarnate Word campus. But there were numerous, numerous springs, and there was a separate branch on the west side, completely separate from the branch of springs that served it on the, west, uh, on the east side. So this is a 1905 map. Because we're looking at the changes over time, because it's really important to understand in the archaeology. This is the same map. This is just a, a blow up of it here. Okay? And this is Giraud. He's still a city, uh, city engineer. And again, here's Broadway making the curve. Here's the, the alignment that is Hildebrand Avenue. And you, know, you can see that there's some changing going on here. The anvil shape stays the same, more or less. You get some mo land modification here. But all of a sudden, there's obviously no dam. And you've got these little fingers of water sticking out here. And there's something else going on. But the one thing that we can count on is the fact that there is still an Asakia Madre shown here, even in 1905. So this is about the time it's getting closed, but it's still being shown on these maps. And here's a map from a city directory from about 1906 by Jules Appler. Uh, and you can see that he is using the city engineer's map. He's still got those same little fingers of land. You got a large island here. And then again, he is still showing the alignment of the uh, Sequia Madre de Valero or the Alamo Ditch. Here's a map of three years later. And again, you know, think of the maps we've seen 1865, 1875, 1879, 1905. Now we're at 1908. And the one thing to remember, the couple things to remember is that we still have Lot 23 shown. We still see an Asakia. The dam is present, then no longer present, but that, you know, the, the, this, this, all this is happening in the right spot, and that this area here at the corner, this northern piece of the anvil, is what is always changing. 
You see a dam, the dam is gone. You see three little fingers of water, you see none. You see, you know, it's, that's because that's where the biggest flood impact is going to happen on that landform. Is every time there's a big flood, it's whacking the, you know, the heck out of that corner of the anvil. And so you get a lot of change in, 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 the, in the landscape environment as a result of that. But again, even in 1908, you know, now we don't have three little fingers, but we have a little island, we have a pretty good amount of water, and we show that we still show the acequia, of the, the Alamo ditch, uh, running through the, what becomes the Woody property in 1925. So here's a whole pastiche of those images that we've talked about. And again, follow it. If you just look through the images, you'll see that the major transformations are you see a dam, you see a dam, you see a dam, you don't see a dam. You still see an acequia on all of the all of the map on all the maps, and you keep seeing these changes in here. Now this is pretty much the same. The dam's configuration is a little bit different, but as you go forward in time, there's all kinds of changes happening in there. And it's great to find them on the map. It's a nightmare to find them in an archaeological project because they don't they don't stay the way you want them to. So. Uh, Yeah, I'm really good at pressing that twice, apparently. Okay, so here's, an, here's Marbach's map of 1935 showing the original woody grounds right here. The, the less attractive building, the, the wonderful one that you guys have now. And this is before Pioneer Hall was built. And what I want to point out to you is this is the anvil here. You don't see it because they, they've made the mistake of not drawing it to my satisfaction. But, um, <laughs> The thing that's interesting is when you look across the river, this is all down low in the floodplain, and you have a little bit of rise coming up into here. But other than that, it's way down low. And then when you go, you, you move this, it's the same thing blown up. You can see this is very flat, and it matches that, that, you know, that dip that we previously saw on the, other, uh, on the previous <laughs> slide. Now this is the same map you just saw. This is the map with the addition of Pioneer Hall. And what is happening is this road has moved over, but they've done a little bit of filling and modification so that they can put that building at the same level as the Witty itself. This area below here is still somewhat low. So in 2010, uh, UTSA CAR was uh, out here on the East Bank doing excavations. Um, and looking for the Presa de Valero or the, or the dam of the, of, of the Alamo Dam. Uh, and we also ended up doing some work uh, in, uh, on, on, the, on the West Bank looking at the uh, upper Labor. So the, again, let's come back to a larger picture. The triangles represent uh, recorded archaeological sites, both historic and prehistoric. Uh, the Alamo Dam and Alamo Seki are shown there. And of course, the upper Labor is there on that side. In the Woody Museum building. Uh, so the so again, we're looking from above at the at the Woody property, and you can see the the Pioneer Museum. This, of course, is not showing the new configuration, but this archaeology was done in advance of the Woody's work, so that it could inform the Woody's work about the archaeological resources on the property, document them, so that then they could be uh, incorporated at least in a design sense or design elemental sense into the work here at the Witte. And when you get done today, walk down and take a look at what they've done here at the articulation between the, where the dam was and the Asakio head was. And I think that you all have done a great job. So uh, it, it's great to be able to see that history uh, recognized here on the grounds of the Witte. And we found evidence of both the dam and of the Asakia. So uh, the problem with dams is they're on bodies of water. And the problem with bodies of water, it's hard to dig in them. And so when actually when we found this, when UTSA found the dam, they're like, oh, look, it's the dam. And then the trip is full of water. <laughs> so uh, this, this was a real, the, the, there, was a, there was a quick sketch and there was a lot of this. But, 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 but that's what it more or less looked like. And if you close your eyes or drink a couple of margaritas, it improves. Now, this was the work that was done out towards the street where, we, where the university was able to capture uh, the, the Aseki is a profile, and you know we just love dirt. Y'all probably don't. It's nothing like you know copper pigment, but you can see here that there's a there's a down cutting through here, 
It's been truncated by a down cutting over here. These are two acechia channels that are probably distinct in time. You know, because acechias, they weren't lined with stone. These were dirt lined. And they might move them, they might deepen them, they might change them, uh, which also makes our life as archaeologists exciting because we want to see it right there on the map, and sometimes it's right over there. So uh, it's just the nature of, the, the nature of the, these, these resources. So wh what happened to the dam? The dam was, was described as being as much as 40 to 70 feet wide in the, in the middle of the 19th century, and we have nothing that looks like that. We have, I have no document that says when it was removed. More than likely it happened when they were doing the waterworks material here in the park. But literally, this is all that we see. It's just this one spot. We dug all these trenches all over the west bank of the river. But this is literally all we found. So this is a meter sticks, which is slightly larger than a yard. This is a pretty big stone. But literally, that large structure that created that huge pool of water, that's all we've got left on the west bank. And there's, you know, there's stuff buried here on the, on, on the east bank. We just can't see it as effectively. So let me talk about the Upper Labor, which is a system that's later in time. It was started in 76, July of 1776. And uh, it was designed to create uh, irrigable lands for Idesenos who had, had been moved to San Antonio. They needed land to, to farm as well. And uh, by, they finally, by 1776, they, they, this, was, this system was started to provide water for lands on the west bank of the river. And that just says basically the same thing. And, and they did the same thing. They created a dam to impound water to push it into the mouth of the Asakia. And it, it also stayed around until the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century when it was closed. Uh, the thing that's interesting about it is the Spanish colonial dams, you saw those big jumble of rocks. They didn't build, you know, dressed stone dams. They went right over here across the river where you have the limestone bluffs, and they hauled those big rocks and boulders down and laid them into the river to create a dam uh, out of a regular stone. Um, the, by the time of the tannery, you have a lot of, uh, you know, German and Polish stonemasons, and uh, they did everything much more, you know, finely in the sense of dressed stone. Uh, we'll see some of that. So the city uh, sold the property to the Confederates for $5,000, and they built a, a manufactory for uh, tanning hides, hence the name tannery, but they also did, uh, created a mill, a lumber mill here. And what you can see here is there's a gate, nice straight lines. You know, when you looked at the earlier, you know, map of, the, of it, it's more sinuous. The reason this is all straight line is because they let some Germans in and, <laughs> and they, did their, they did their thing. So, um, so, so how do we know about it? This is a long thing. I don't want to read you the whole thing, but there's this agreement in 1875 between George Brackeridge and the city of San Antonio about the fact that he doesn't want Hildebrand Avenue running his property, so he trades some property. But in the, in all of that trade is this thing where it says, you know, in favor of you opening the street where we want it, um, that you can, you know, uh, it's, it's next to this piece of property that's cut by a trench by G. Herman. And nobody ever looked at the G. Herman thing. We'll come back to it. But it says that the city has a right to build a gate in the said trench, Herman's trench, and to raise the water of the branch which feeds the upper Labor ditch to the height of the dam and no higher. Well, why? Well, I mean, I had to spend some time figuring that out. We'll talk about it. And it says it's the aforesaid dam erected during the Civil War. Well, wait a minute. The Spanish had a dam there. Well, they did. They're both there. We'll talk about that real quick. So this is this is this is extant. You can walk down and look at this in the park. It's right there when you come in off Elder Brand Avenue. There's a pool there. They called it a lily pond. But that pool actually represents the catchment pool that provided water into the Upper Labor system, both during the Spanish as well as the Civil War. And what you're looking at here are, uh, the, this is the Civil War stuff. See how nice and straight it is? Uh, and, th and then this area here is actually stuff that was added you know, in the 20th century uh, in front of uh, the older uh, Confederate works. This is, this, is some, this is the area of the Sluice Works. And it's, uh, you can, again, you can, this is still buried in the park, uh, but you can see just how finely dressed the stone is 
It's nice and righty tidy. Uh, it, it is not colonial. So let's talk about what happened. So when we did work on the dam, it turned out that we found this nice dressed dam up above. And as you got down lower, you ran into these large irregular boulders. And so what it appears, more than what it appeared, that what the Confederates did, and we kept finding these posts dug into the colonial superstructure. And what they did is, you know, you may not realize this, but it's very difficult to build masonry while you're standing in a river. <laughs> yeah. So what happened here is they had to build a coffer dam. They they built they built a coffer dam around that colonial construction, and these are the planks. This is a rotted plank that remains. So we found bits of them all the way around the, around the dam. And so what it told us was they came in, built this coffer dam, so they would be dry inside, and they could go in and lay in new courses of stone. And one of the things that's interesting about those courses of stone is they raised the height of the dam. And by raising the height of the dam, water ceased to flow from those West Branch Springs into the San Antonio River because they captured 100% of it. And that became a problem later when you had you know, decreases in rainfall and people weren't getting enough water out of the San Antonio River because those darn Confederates up in the park had taken all of the water. And so we'll come back to that too. Pretty interesting story. So here's, a, you know, here's, the, here's a, a, what we call a plan view. And you can see here's the wooden post. This is that colonial piece. It's irregular. It's sticking out. And here's that nice German stuff. You know, it's nice and straight, lying on top of colonial construction. Uh, and these are our excavations in uh, 13 to 15. Um, here's the mouth. Here's the, what they call the lily pond, catching the water and funneling it here. All of this dirt that you see around the structure, both above it and on the sides, that's all flood deposits that have laid on top of it over the years. That, that was the, the landform itself stopped here where the dam was, but the presence of that dam over time allowed sediment to build up and cover this. And here are some more images of it again. Here is that colonial construction below, the Confederate construction above, and here we are looking down the length of it. But there's all kinds of holes that have been blasted in it over the years uh, through park activities or otherwise. Uh, here's, uh, here's looking at it, um, uh, ignore that title, I, I changed the slides, but uh, here's, a, here's a map of 26. Were, you can see there's three openings there. Maybe they opened through the dam at that time to make a pretty area in the park. I don't know. But here we have it again in 1939, 13 years later, and those three little openings are no longer there, and there's no dam there at all. I mean, so there's all kinds of dynamic things still going on here. Uh, and these are the various and sundry sections of the dam. Here's a, a, a water pipe that goes straight through it. <laughs> it, you know, it it's going to get impacted. If you, if you can see that water, but if you want to make, if you, wanna, if you ever have to put out a fire on the north end of Brackenridge Park, you should be grateful for that water pipe. But if you're a historian and archaeologist like me, I hate that water pipe. <laughs> um, and so here, and again, here's a cement culvert that went through to help drain the lily pond. And so this is, a, 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 this is what we project it looking like over time. So here's the dam running from one landform to the other, putting, creating a pool of water, sending water down the upper Labore, and any excess water would flow into the river. Uh, here it is, 1865 to 75, with the dam it made, you know, improved, made larger, stone lined the walls, created a new head gate. Uh, here it is sometime after 75 to 1940, where you have punctures made through the dam, and then here it is, you know, sometime after 1940 when they built the lily pond walls and all of the soil and sediment uh, building up against it. This line is that line that cuts through the, through the dam and then uh, it goes up to a fire hydrant right there. So the reason I bring up Herman's Trench is uh, I would like to have met Gregoire Herman because he, uh, he was a pretty smart guy. He, he built a trench there so that he could control water from either side. And that way, the city and the Confederacy had to deal with it. He could turn off the water. <laughs> he could move from the east side to the west side, the west side to the east side, or you know, he, he could do something else. So I know that we need to get to q and I've probably talked too long. My apologies. And, uh, uh, I think that's it. Thank you. So, um, Pam?
Instagram if you could join Clint uh, here and uh, Samantha will be walking around uh, for those of you who have questions and did you have a question right here no uh, yeah. could you, Samantha could you so everybody can hear you uh, I, was, I was a little surprised that the um, the uh, acequias weren't lined with stone I thought they were so what uh, enabled them to maintain their integrity um, when the, with the water going through is it the clay content in the soil I mean it's an excellent it's a, question So uh, during the Spanish period, uh, maintenance of an acequia system was incumbent upon the users of the system. So you had rights to water, but those rights to water were also predicated on rights of, uh, on responsibilities for maintenance. And so on an annual basis, these ditch companies or acequia companies would get together and everybody who had property abutting the acequia using the water would have to clean out their section of the acequia. And so that's where you have ditch masters and literally the oldest European water rights in Texas accrue to the ditch companies in San Antonio for the San Antonio missions and their acequias. Uh, now, you know, the reason why they get stone lined is the, the city took over operation of the, uh, of the Madre, the Alamo Madre system, and as a result, they lined the ditches and they paid for that through water rents because it was easier to line the ditches and not have to maintain them. Uh, and, and so that's how that happened. Thank you. This is for Pam. Uh, there's a couple of mentions about pigments in the very first Spanish diaries to San Antonio before they established the town. And one is, one of the diaries mentions that their, their translator says one of the names of a creek here is what the local Indians call the place where we get the colors to paint our shields. And the other one is Alazan Creek. And I don't know how many people here speak Spanish, but Alazan has a meaning of a brown, a reddish brown color. Uh, uh, we have a word, uh, alizarin crimson in English, but uh, the original meaning of the creek was maybe it cut a bank of reddish uh, pigment. George, it's very interesting. I'll have to get with you later on that. <laughs> In terms of the motifs that you've discovered at, in the Alamo, have you speculated on any other symbolism or symbolics? I was looking in terms of the numbers of all the petals in the oval and any of the other flowers, the lily, any speculation on that? Yeah, I've done some research on um, the symbolism behind them. We know that a pomegranate you know, represents fertility and um, the three Petal flower has lots of different meanings in the Catholic Church. And so um, I'm hoping that once I know more about all the different frescoes in that room, that I'll be able to draw more of a conclusion as to what the meaning is behind all of those. Thank you for asking. Uh, two, two things. Number one, Pam's enthusiasm blows me away. And I would not want to be standing within 10 feet of her if they find anything new in the Alamo. <laughs> uh, question on the acequia, I'm just wondering. Uh, they discovered when they did the water at Petra that it's four degrees so that it drains in there. Was there a engineered type of degree of drainage on the uh, acequias? Uh, so... It, it appears to me uh, and to others that you know, they, they obviously had a system. Uh, some people say they used a plow and that they just would you know, dig a furrow and follow where the water went. Uh, you know, but you know, it, it was not a new technology for them to put these acequias in. Interestingly enough, anecdotally, in the 19th century, uh, there was a move to expand the upper labor as a flood control ditch over to the Alazon. And then there was also a, a ditch uh, developed on the east side that became known as the Valley Ditch uh, to irrigate land over there. And uh, one of my favorite quotes from the newspaper when they're being taken to task because that system doesn't work is that apparently the city engineer is unaware that water does not flow uphill. <laughs> so, uh, there, and, and people took them to, you know, hey, the, the Spanish Padres managed to do this, what's your problem? So, but it, you know, they, they obviously know that gravity 
they did it all by gravity flow. Uh, we have one minute left. Uh, it, regarding the, the gravity flow, uh, when we tested uh, over here along Mulberry, um, right there in, um, in the, at the edge of the park, and we hit uh, Upper Labor, uh, it, we knew it was what it was because uh, I think it's some, in, in the 1915 and 1920s, somewhere along in there, they started building the sewer lines with brick. And they ran the sewer line down the Asakia because they knew that the grade was already dis, uh, decided by the Spanish. No, you're exactly right. And, and I don't recommend you do this except on a very off day and low traffic. But if you go to the Denny's <laughs> on Commerce Street, uh, right there by the corner, there's an, an opening that goes down into the, uh, San, into the storm sewer. And uh, again, don't do this while there's traffic. But if you look down in there, you will be looking straight into the Alamo Madre ditch. And it is filled with utilities. <laughs> I mean, why dig a trench when you've already got one? I mean, you know, so there are a lot of our acequias have been repurposed at, for utility purposes uh, in, the, in the early 20th century. Thank you all Yay, so ditches. Thank you all so much.